So today, what we are going to do is we are going to take up a decently big component and we are going to try and mesh it. Uh, we are going to improve the mesh quality. Uh, we are also going to talk about what is mesh flow. And we are we will basically try to get a quality that the industry demands. OK, so uh, in academia, generating a mesh is one part, but, you know, generating a mesh that can be used in the industry that requires a skill that is you know completely on a different level so we will try to get a mesh which uh, can be used or which is actually acceptable by the industry so that you have an idea of uh, what is expected when uh, someone is asked to do a mesh okay then uh, we will also try to execute different kinds of mesh so Maybe mold flow we won't address today because you know uh, it's not very relevant right away. But uh, as someone asked yesterday, uh, I'm not sure if that guy has joined. But someone asked me uh, when we were talking about mid surface mesh that how would the mesh for maybe a sphere would look like. So for that reason, I am introducing the tetra mesh option here. So tetra mesh is basically a mesh that is built up of uh, 3D elements, which are tetrahedral elements. And lastly, we are also going to see a component that has hexa mesh in it, or basically a 3D component, which will be built up using hexahedral elements. Okay, so these are the different kinds of mesh that we have. Finally, uh, what I'm going to do is we will import a mesh that I already have, and we are going to try and decide if that is a good mesh or a bad mesh, because uh, you know, most of the times it is going to happen that you yourselves are going to be the evaluators for uh, all the kinds of meshing activity that you do. So it becomes very important to know how to judge a mesh basically, right? So that is what we will try to achieve uh, in this last bit for meshing in hypermesh. Uh, then as, uh, you know, I like to close on a on an interesting note. So that note today is going to be uh, some kind of automation that we are going to see in hypermesh but before we do that i'm going to try and explain to you uh, what is the need for automation you know so we all know that okay automation is good and you know stuff like that but uh, how does it really benefit the industry in terms of uh, well the money so that is what i'm going to explain uh, then we will discuss how difficult really is it to write a macro for hypermesh Finally, we will also talk about some opportunities for the automation experts. And then uh, what's more is we are actually going to write a macro which can right away be used by the industry. Sounds exciting, right? I hope it does. So yeah, that is what I have on the plate for you today. So to start off, I am going to uh, resume where we left off yesterday. So. If you remember, we generated a mesh that looked something like this. So basically, you know, this was our component and we started meshing it. So what we did is essentially we just meshed one half of the component and then uh, we reflected the mesh and then we checked for, you know, the free edges. So if I try to show the free edges again, shift F3. I selected the elements. I can also select the components. Uh, left click, drag and drop, find edges. So as you can see, uh, we have red borders everywhere, right? So these outside borders are fine. Uh, if you have followed yesterday's session, these outside borders are something that we would expect because uh, they are at the end of the component, right? So there is nothing beyond these uh, edges. So they make sense. But what does not make sense is this red line that we are getting in the middle. So uh, before we get to these free edges and stuff, I wanted to show you something that I missed yesterday. So two things basically. So as I mentioned, uh, the convention for hypermesh geometry, if we go to the 2D topology mode is, if it's a green edge, uh, it is shared by uh, two surfaces. If it's a red edge, it is not shared by any surface. And if it is shared by more than two surfaces, it turns out to be yellow, 
okay so this yellow colored line i did not show it to you yesterday so now if i delete this surface f2 surface is delete automatically that line would turn to green okay so this is the one point that uh, maybe i missed to show you yesterday second point is uh, about you know the scrolling part so what happens is uh, sometimes the point of rotation of your screen is also very important and you should know how to fix that point so how do we do that hold down control click on any part on your screen and you can see this small white square so now what has happened is this has become your point of rotation so now if i'm holding down control and if i am sort of rotating it is going to rotate about that point now if i repeat the same exercise for some other location that is let's say here it's not happening because my part has a dimension of just uh, you know uh, it it spans only until here so if i click here now the point has shifted to this and again uh, you know this is how it is happening so uh, just make sure that if you're not able to scroll the model properly ensure that your point of rotation is set so how do we do that control plus left click on any point on the screen okay so now we are going to address this problem of free edges okay uh, one more thing uh, so if you remember okay again one more question for you guys so if you remember yesterday i told you that when we begin a hypermesh session we do two things uh, specifically when we press o does anyone remember what are the two things that we did maybe i'll uh, see the chat box uh guys anyone what are the two things that we ensured to do yesterday yes one is changing the advanced remesh what is the second one mm, not essentially checking free edges uh, we did something else um all right so what we essentially did is we changed the display option to thick 1d lines okay so i'm going to explain what that means now uh, my second question is how many of you have actually understood what a free edge is with respect to fea not the the cad one the mesh one or the finite element model one has everyone understood what a free edge is yes or no okay great because now we are going to try and fix the free edges so it makes sense to uh, see if you have really understood okay perfect so now i'm going to share my screen again okay so now uh, pay close attention to what happens to the free edges okay i'm going to press o i'm going to go to graphics i will switch this option off so as you can see what is happening is these red colored lines that you saw they are becoming thick and thin right so if they are thick it becomes easy for us to uh, find out if there are any free edges in the model which is why uh, we enabled this option okay secondly now let's try to understand why we are getting a free edge here or what is the significance of this free edge so if you are getting a free edge somewhere inside the part if i am going to translate it in terms of cad what that really means is you have a crack in your part so if you see this original cad there uh, this part is continuous but uh, if i uh, notice that there is a free edge here that means that there is a crack in the part in the middle now uh, let me show you uh, what free edge uh, really means okay so i'm going to go to shift f4 i'm going to select uh, make sure that you are just clicking here okay no drag and drop so i'll just click let's say i'm setting the magnitude to be 0.1 or 0.5 i'm going to translate it in let's say x direction and i'm going to say translate so as you can see uh, only one node translated so if i repeat the same exercise for some other location let's say here 
as you can see both uh, these elements are being changed but here only one element sort of deformed i'll show again on this point right so what free edge essentially means is these two nodes they are not connected to each other so you would say that okay both these nodes are at the same location but they are not connected so what do we do if we want to you know really connect these nodes together so i'll undo to get the model back to the way it was okay now uh, for those of you who are acquainted with any cad softwares there is something known as tolerance what does tolerance mean so let's say if you have specified a tolerance value of let's say 0.01 mm what does that mean any entity that is at a distance less than 0.01 mm is going to be treated as one entity so the exact same logic we are going to apply to our model here i'm going to again go to shift f3 i'll select all the elements and now i am going to say the tolerance value of 0.01 i'm going to say preview equivalence so as you can see by preview equivalence what hypermesh is trying to tell me is there are nodes on all of these locations which are at a distance less than 0.01 uh, whatever units we have specified so now uh, if i want to connect these two nodes together i'm going to say equivalence right so now i'll get back to the normal view uh, if you have noticed before there was a dark black edge that was being shown here and now uh, it has disappeared in the similar fashion if i want to check i'll again go to shift f3 find edges and now as you can see the free edges have been removed okay so why is there so much stress on free edges so as i just explained the existence of a free edge essentially means that there is a crack in the model at that location now imagine if there is a free edge on this location that i am currently showing you right so what would that mean from an fea perspective that this rib is not at all connected to uh, you know this part of uh, this face of the part so what would that imply this is actually very weak so if it receives any force it will break off easily but is that the case in the cad no in the cad everything is connected perfectly well this is the reason why free edges are a big blunder in your cad mod or in your fea model to tell you in a language that uh, the industry professionals say if there is a free edge in your model you have no idea how to mesh a component so people are that strict about free edges when it comes to the industry okay so uh, with that i think we can close uh, what we wanted to do yesterday uh, one last bit that is remaining is uh, if you remember a, a final mesh should be something that resembles the cad right so now if i do a 2d detailed representation which means i want my elements to be you know thicker or represent them in a 3d format it is not happening right they do not resemble the cad in any way right even if i show you the shaded element representation my cad is 3d but my elements appear to be 2d so again a question to you how do i fix this or what is missing if you remember the discussion yesterday i think you should be able to answer yes so some of them are answering thickness some of them are saying proper and not assigned that is actually the most appropriate answer okay great so yes uh, you guys are pretty intelligent i would say that's a good sign so now i'm going to create a property right click create property let's assign thickness so i know for a fact that the thickness is 2 mm i'm going to go to the mid surface i'm going to assign property and now as you can see all of a sudden we have the 3d element representation for the part implying that our job as as far as the mesh is concerned is complete if at all this part is going to be used further for a simulation as well 
uh, one more thing that we could do is we can also assign a material to this part but you all probably already know how to do that right just for the sake of completeness create material uh, we are going to assign all the values by default these are of steel okay with surface component i'm going to go to materials and that's all right uh, one more interesting thing that you can do is go to tools mass calculation and now since you have already assigned the material if you just click on this component and say calculate you will get all of these values right so yeah that is how you can probably have a look okay so i'll just save this and close it and let's uh, you know start a new model so uh, a quick feedback guys so is everything clear so far are there any doubts that need to be answered because from here on uh, it is going to be purely uh, the hypermesh experience uh, i'll be talking a lot about the different uh, commands that we will be using and stuff like that so from here on uh, i would try to avoid talking about the basics because you know i don't want to get into a loop so if there are any queries just let me know right away okay so the question on trias uh, i will address that uh, in uh, let's say another 10 minutes so have some patience um anything else guys or should i proceed so if there are no questions let's begin okay so i i have opened a blank hm i'm going to open a new model so i have a hypermesh file ready which reads as demo parts um, that we used yesterday so today we will be using this new file if at all uh, you don't have a hypermesh file for the cad what you can also do is you can import the cad from the options that i mentioned yesterday so import uh, in import you can have import geometry and inside geometry you will have an option to you know import different kinds of uh, geometry files so it could be step it could be katia and all of that so depending on uh, the kind of license that you have you will get uh, different import options okay so enough about that so i uh, just focus on these three components first one is the sheet metal so what i mean by sheet metal is um, this is not a plastic component this will have relatively uh, lesser complexity and uh, relatively it is much easier to mesh as compared to a plastic part so since it's the first time that you are going to actually mesh an industry grade component i have chosen sheet metal as the simplest example next what we are going to do is we are going to mesh this component by using 3d hexa elements and i also had an example for tetra but uh, we are not going to do that because it might take a while so instead of this what i'm going to show you is um, how does the mesh for a sphere look like okay for this fourth component um, you'll have to wait there is a climax to it uh, let's see okay so first things first i am going to create a sphere so how do i do that first i'll go to geometry or first i'll create the center node for it so create now i have the center node i'll go to surfaces i need a sphere so i'll click on this fourth icon i'll click on the center i've chosen the center i'll enter the radius create now i see what is the problem so as you can see the sphere has turned out to be in the same component that the sheet metal was why is that that is because um, my current collector was set to be sheet metal so my first job now is to separate this sphere and put it into a different component because you know i like to keep my model well organized so what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a new component let's call it sphere and now i want to select these surfaces and move it into this component so there are a lot of ways to do it but i'm going to show you uh, i'll try to show you most of them so 
shift 11 is uh, the shortcut for organized entities. What I can do is uh, first I can maybe uh, hide the original component, the sheet metal component. So I'll go to F5. I'll select any one surface, surfaces. So once you click on surfaces, you get different smart options for selection that are uh, provided by HyperMesh. So what I'm going to say is by attached. So as you can see, uh, all the surfaces that were attached have been selected. I'll say mask. Again, I'll go to shift F11. Sorry, shift. Yeah, shift F11. Then I'm going to again drag and drop. I'm going to say move. So now, as you can see, Oh, I think I have copied it instead of moving it. Anyway, so again, same exercise. What I can do is F2 surface. So it will take a while to select the surface because some issue with the graphics. Yes, and delete entity. Okay, so now I have it here. Great, so my sphere is ready. Now, uh, guys, uh, there's something very interesting that is happening. So if you can uh, have a look at how light behaves on the sphere surface, you can observe a very faint mesh. Uh, I hope you can see that. So this is not really a mesh. This is just a form of graphical representation. But again, as I mentioned, you can't display something infinite. So even the people who are working with the display, they have broken down the surface into smaller elements. And those smaller elements essentially reconstruct the uh, the curvature for you. So which is why uh, you can notice this, uh, you know, squares around it. Okay, so uh, that's another very good example of how discretization really works. So if you have very small number of building entities, it will essentially increase, uh, you know, the time required to display and the resources. Anyway, that was just an additional information. So now what I'm going to do is, uh, as I can see, uh, this division of the surface isn't proper. So in order to do that, I'll go to F8. I will create three nodes on this line. Surface edit. I have selected this. I am trimming it with, you know, uh, these three points. And now I have a complete division. So uh, any cross section taken of the sphere from the center gives you, you know, the maximum diameter and in 2D format, it is going to look like a circle. Okay, now one more thing that I can do is I want a good mesh, which is why I'm going to also divide the surfaces further. So surface edit. Again, I'm selecting this. This time I'm going to divide it using the xy plane so that is why i'll have to select z axis here and my base point is going to be this so again this is done one more time this time i'm going to use uh, maybe the y axis the base point remains same and trim okay so now my uh, you know my sphere is well divided i can go to f12 so this time, uh, since I'm doing a 3D mesh and you know the building block for the 3D mesh is a trier element, I can either use uh, the trier option here, but I prefer to use R trier when I have a very sharp curvature because that has a better representation. So I'll select all of these, I'll say mesh. And this is how the mesh for the sphere would look like. But now the obvious question that you will have is a sphere is basically a filled entity. And if I sort of hide some of the elements from my mesh, uh, what you could see is this is a hollow, right? So now I'm going to show you how I'm going to fill this up, okay? So as I mentioned, we are going to use a 3D mesh. I'm going to go to 3D, Tetra mesh, um, let's select all these elements. This option, I prefer to keep it to split quads because just in case if I have forgotten to, uh, you know, split any quad uh, element, uh, this helps with that. 
In data meshing parameters, I have an option to control my growth rate. What is growth rate? I'll explain in a bit, but for now, let's have a look at the result. Uh, by default, the option here is mesh to current component, but what will happen is my 2D mesh and 3D mesh will go to the same component, which is why I'm saying create per volume, okay? And then let's end the climax. You can, if you have read on the lower left-hand side corner, uh, okay, yeah, it is still working. Yes, so it's done. I'll hide the 2D mesh. This is the new component that was generated. So let's have a look. And now I'm going to hide uh, these elements again. Mask. And as you can see now, we have you know tetrahedral elements that have filled the complete sphere. If you want to have a deeper look on how a tetrahedral element looks like, what I can do is mask reverse. And yes, so as you can see, this is how your tetrahedral element looks like. Okay, so now the question about growth rate. So again, um, just remember how this looks like from the inside and then I'll show you uh, the growth rate. Okay, let's save it by some name. Let's get back to the 2D model, 3D tetra mesh, tetra meshing parameters. And let's set this to 1.05 so that we will have a uniform distribution across the thickness and mesh. So this time I'm expecting it to take a while longer, but surprisingly it did it faster. Okay, so as you can see, uh, this was the older one, uh, this is the newer one, and this is, uh, you know, the older one. So as you can see across the cross section, we have coarser uh, mesh here or by coarser, what I mean is large elements across the cross section. And with the new mesh, we have finer elements. So a quick check. So if I go to elements, if I select the elements for the newer one, we have close to 3,800 elements. If I do that for the older model, we have close to 3,600 models. So, you know, it makes sense that you have finer elements across the thickness and yeah. So yes, that is how a 3D Tetra mesh would look like. Um, any queries so far, I'll be happy to answer or anything unclear. Okay, um, guys, uh, I would request that you focus on what is happening in the session right now uh, regarding recordings and anything like that. We will, uh, you know, we will discuss about it maybe at the end of the session or something. So don't bother about recording. Just focus on what is happening right now because, you know, recordings won't help you if you don't understand anything in the live session, right? Is Tetra mesh difficult or can we select the four sided mesh? Is Tetra Mesh default? Okay. Uh, see, it's your choice whether you want a Hexa Mesh or a Tetra Mesh. Uh, everything is possible. Okay. All right. So now we will start with you know the industry grade mesh that I talked about. Okay. There are questions coming up. Okay, so, all right, uh, I'm getting questions about quality and I'm also guessing, getting questions about how the part was filled up. So maybe I'll show that again. Okay, so to fill up this part, first I had the 2D mesh, then I went to the 3D Tetra mesh option here. I selected all my elements. What I could do is I could also select the component uh, there is also an option to generate the Tetra mesh directly on uh, you know, your CAD, but for now, let's stick to this method. Then let's go to Tetra meshing parameters. I set the growth rate to 1.05. Let's keep it to the default of 1.3. And I'm simply going to say mesh. So a new component will appear here, which will have, you know, the values for, um, uh, or rather the, elements that we are looking for. 
So if I mask some part, you will be able to see the cross section. Uh, if you're talking about the tetra mesh quality parameters, typically they are, uh, let me show it instead. So if you go to F10, if you go to 3D, so these are all the parameters that exist for 3D. Uh, as you can understand, so maybe for those who know what are quality parameters, warp page won't exist for a triangular or a tetrahedral element. But for tetrahedral, we do look for tet collapse and volumetric skew. So these are the two parameters that we typically look for for a tetrahedral mesh. Okay, so um, it will be beyond the scope of today's session to explain all these quality parameters. So, uh, you know, let's not worry about that. Let's stick to, uh, you know, the simpler part of this activity. Okay, so now we will move forward to, uh, you know, the actual sheet metal component. Okay, so, let, okay, one more thing. So as you can see right now, this part has become transparent. Uh, in order to remove the transparency, I'll click on this. Uh, you can either do this and say return. So the transparency will be removed. Okay, next, uh, even though this part appears quite big, uh, if you have noticed, I have drawn these lines. So some part of, uh, some part of this component, you can reflect and reuse. Right. So, for example, if you have a look at this top left corner, it is reflected down here. And again, uh, this top right corner is reflected. Also, if you reflect the left part to the right part, there's a little uh, modification that we will uh, that will be needed. But all in all, you can reuse the mesh. Right. So modification in this region as well as in this region. So, you know, this is the first strategy that you need to follow uh, whenever you get a new part. First, look for symmetry, look for uh, things that are repeating so that you can mesh just once and reuse that mesh again. Okay, so this is the strategy that will uh, save a lot of time for you and you know get you uh, the desired results in least amount of efforts. Okay, so now, uh, okay, I have set this into this view. Now, what I need to do is, uh, unfortunately, this uh, zoom bar for me doesn't disappear quite often. Anyway, so I'm going to select just one part and move it into a different collector for ease of use. So again, F5, F5 is the shortcut for masking. I'm going to select surfaces. I'll carefully try to select just the part that I need. Okay, I'll say mask and reverse. So let's observe if any extra, uh, you know, face has been selected. If not, then uh, this is the part that we will be working on. Okay, so it appears that everything is in order. So again, I'll create new component. Let's say one quarter. I'll go to shift F11. Again, I'll select the surfaces and I'll say copy, right? I'll switch off the original component and I'll just focus on the new component that we have created. So the first thing that you can notice is since we are no longer looking at the complete component, we have only copied one part of the component, which is why we are getting the red edges here, indicating that there is no surface attached to these edges, okay? So as you guys rightly pointed out, the first step is going to be mid surface. I'll select all the surfaces. I'll say extract. So on the lower left hand side corner, you can see uh, the percentage completion for the mid surface. One more advantage of splitting your part is the mid surface generation process uh, does not take as long as it typically should. Okay. so. If you give just one quarter of the component, the time required also reduces dramatically. Okay, next, uh, I'm going to switch on the hard points because they are going to determine where the nodes will be placed. Okay, so this is going to be our starting point. Now, uh, just to 
you know show you guys how stuff or how the mesh would appear if we mesh it just as it is i'm going to go to f12 i have set the average size to be 4 i'll say mixed i've selected everything and i will say mesh I'm going to accept it as it is because I just want to see how the overall flow of the mesh looks like. And I'm also going to set this to element quality view. Okay, now let's have a look at what has happened. Okay. So the first thing that I notice is there are a lot of trias. So they are not good for me. Uh, the holes, uh, I'm happy that they are captured using six nodes because that is the typical convention. Um, I see a lot of failed elements near this feature here. So a yellow color, a faint yellow color essentially means that the size of the element has is less than the quality criteria that we have uh, decided. Okay, so that is the observation. Next, what I notice is uh, I am getting an additional row of elements and that is being generated because there is an additional hard point here. So this uh, dot that you can see, I'm calling it a hard point. Um, hypermesh's default uh, denomination for that is fixed point. Okay, the significance of fixed point or these green lines is if you use auto mesh, hypermesh will uh, sort of make sure that your mesh follows the green line and there is a node on every fixed point. Okay, so that is there. Then another problem is, uh, as you can see, hypermesh here is confused on how should the mesh flow like. So to understand mesh flow, uh, there is no easy way. You have to practice a lot to know what is a good mesh flow and what is a bad mesh flow. But with practice, uh, you will be able to do it. Uh, to give you a taste on what a mesh flow would look like, a good mesh flow would look like, uh, imagine wrapping this part uh, in, let's say, a net that has you know uh, square holes in it. So. I just try to imagine how uniform it would look like and that is how your mesh or your ideal mesh should be okay the least number of trias would be appreciated and wherever you see two opposite trias it indicates that they can combine together to give you uh, a quadrilateral okay so some of you have asked questions about uh, you know um, if we don't need trias why don't we just use quads so let me show you what happens if you use quads. Okay, so as you can see, now there are no trias, but my mesh sort of looks weird. Uh, there is no definite flow. So for example, if I assume that my mesh is flowing from left to right, as soon as I come to this part, my mesh is either going in this direction or it is flowing off in some other direction and stuff like that. Okay. So this is what is known as a direction of flow of the mesh. And this is very important uh, in an FEA perspective, but to explain you why is that important or why is a trial element not really uh, a good choice, uh, it would take a bit more experience into the FEA field. So for now, you'll have to you know believe my word for it. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get back to the original part the mixed mesh return so uh, this is the benefit of a sheet metal component that you have great surfaces everywhere so you can easily uh, you know create mesh but if you go for a plastic component the problem is the mid surface isn't very good you have a lot of missing faces you have uh, some weird protrusions and all of that. So because of that, things become really, really difficult. All right, enough about the problems. Let's talk about the solutions. So for now, I am intentionally keeping the mesh as advanced remesh. Okay. Uh, this is not really advised in some cases because this leads sometimes to uh, a complete uh, hang or maybe segmentation error for the software. But uh, if I keep it on, you guys will be able to follow really well what is happening here. Okay, so first thing is I am going to uh, sort of de-feature my geometry. What does de-feature mean? 
I'm going to remove the lines and points which are not needed and maybe add points and lines where I feel that could really improve the mesh flow for me. Okay, so let's start off with the left hand side. And I'm going to go into a wireframe geometry mode. So what I can notice is if I have a point here, I can change the orientation of the hole and maybe that is going to help with uh, the overall positioning. So I'll go to F11, I'll add a point here. I'll also add a point here, add remove point. I've removed these two points. So as you can see with this small modification, my mesh has started to look better and the mesh is changing because I have the advanced stream mesh option on. Next, I want my mesh to flow along the Y direction. So I have selected this node uh, with this second option. I'm going to drop a line from this node that is perpendicular to this line. So again, once I do that, my mesh flow has improved dramatically. So again, very helpful for me. Next, what I want to ensure is uh, I my mesh is very uh, you know perpendicular to each other, orthogonal mesh. So how am I going to do that? I'll click on this point. I'll drop a line here. Same thing for this. Uh, maybe I can try it here if it works fine. Okay, it's working. I have a lot of trias here, but this I'm going to address later. Um, so guys, uh, I will need you to have some patience because meshing uh, is sort of an art. So you will really have to be patient until you get it right. Okay, so uh, please try to follow what I'm doing and I'll try to explain everything. But yes, your patience is much appreciated. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a line that passes or that sort of separates one segment. Okay, so surface edit. One more thing that I would like to say is uh, there is no one way to mesh a component. Okay, so whatever method suits you, uh, that is what you should follow. Okay, now I need to define a plane for trimming and notice how I'm going to do it. So this point to this point, this becomes my normal to the plane and I'm going to give this as the base point. So you can either specify a plane using three nodes or you can also specify it using a normal and uh, you know uh, a base point. So that is what I have done. I'm going to say trim. As you can see, my mesh flow has improved a bit, right? So let's continue doing uh, this. Okay, here, uh, as you can see, I have two points, which is why uh, it could be a problem. What I'll do is I'll just create one point at the center and I'll remove the additional points so that, you know, my mesh flow is improved. So which features to, you know, to consider for defeaturing and all of that, you know, that is more of a personal choice, but whatever gives you the best mesh flow, uh, that is what you should follow. Okay, then what I notice is I can have a line running through these holes uh, that is that will sort of, you know, align my mesh again in a perpendicular fashion. So again, I'll use this. I could also use the trim uh, surface using plane command here, but I also wanted to demonstrate this uh, feature. So, yeah. I have added a point here. I am removing the other points because I believe they are causing uh, these trias. Um, no luck, but never mind. I will maybe remesh it. Hopefully, that should solve the problem. If not, then uh, maybe we will have to work in a different fashion. But these opposite trias, for sure, we can have them removed. Um, one more option that you can try is you go to mesh style, set all to quads, or maybe you can set this to mixed, map as a rectangle, set all, set all, mesh. 
but again this is creating problems so this is not the right way uh, you'll have to maybe give different options a try if this does not work then we have no option left but to uh, work it up later when we are going to work with just the fe elements and not uh, the cad okay then again i'm going to repeat the same exercise for this part okay this point to this mm, all right i can work with that okay this is also one important point to be noticed so as you can see if you observe the orientation of this hole and the orientation of the hole here so uh, you can see that one of the hole is pointing in the y direction and the other one is pointing in the z direction so it's a good practice to have all your holes aligned across you know just one direction so that really helps at times so what i'm going to do is either we can change the orientation of this hole or i can change the orientation for this hole so i believe uh, this orientation will uh, be better suited for our needs here so i'm going to just uh, you know change the orientation for this one okay again i'll have to repeat the same exercise for this uh, it's just a convention that we follow but not a necessity so if you want you can uh, ignore this part and even that should be fine not an issue so right now for some odd reason ah uh, yeah okay it's done okay so i went too further ahead uh, let's first take care of the regions here so here what i can again do is f11 this node i can connect to yeah so as you can see with a simple operation of you know connecting a few things together my mesh flow is improving dramatically so if you have noticed what i'm trying to do is i'm dividing uh, the complete geometry into uh, a set of squares so if i'm able to successfully do that my mesh flow will be taken care of automatically right so as you can see some of the triads are taking care of themselves so again a good sign for me okay that is good Okay, so this is a tedious part of the process, but yes, it has to be done. So just bear with me. Okay, eleven. Okay. So yes, I am successful in dividing this component well. Now maybe I can have one more addition here. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll leave some parts intentionally because I also want to demonstrate how uh, you can work with the elements as well. So uh, not necessary that all the time you will get a good mid surface to work upon. So sometimes you also have to work with remeshing the elements. So I'll demonstrate some part using remeshing of elements as well. Okay. So uh, one thumb rule is as far as possible, try to align your mesh flow in the CAD itself. Because once you start working on the mesh flow, uh, when you are working with the elements, it becomes extremely uh, you know tedious and time consuming. Okay, so okay for now let's keep it like this. Now. 
for example, let's say we have to work with the mesh flow in this region. So uh, just forget that I have a mid surface here. Okay, I only want to work with my FE entity. So how will I do that? First, I will switch off my advanced remesh and keep it to keep mesh. Now, uh, please pay close attention. So what I'm doing is, let's say I pick these two nodes. And what I want to do is I want to align these two nodes or maybe think of a line that is connecting these two nodes. So how do we do that? I'll go to F3. I will sort of connect these two nodes together. F3 is basically a replace node option. I replace these two nodes to generate uh, just one single node. I will go to F7. Here I have an option to align the nodes together. So this node to this node. Uh, first node and second node are the endpoints of your line and I'll drag and drop to align the remaining nodes. So yes, this is done. Now I'll go to F12. I'll go to elements. I will select these elements here. Let's see what kind of mesh flow we get. So as you can see, uh, immediately the mesh flow has improved. We have a nice uh, well aligned flow. Same thing I'm going to repeat for this part as well. So again, try to ensure that whenever you select or maybe you do a selection, it is something that resembles a square. Okay, now to answer the question that one of you asked that why do we really need tria elements? Think of it this way. So if you look at this line, AutoMesh has given us one, two, three, four, five, six elements. Now, when, uh, when you start moving towards the left, your opposite edge sort of has, you know, reduced number of uh, elements or maybe reduced length. So if you want to reduce or if you want to achieve this converging flow, you have only one option to introduce trias because trias essentially combine two nodes, right? So if you have one, two, three, four, five, six elements, then you will need three tria elements to reduce this number to, you know, just two elements. So that is the function of trias. And yes, even though we don't need them uh, or maybe we don't desire them, but still uh, they are an important part of, uh, you know, the whole FEA modeling process. Okay, so then I removed one more tria that was near the free edge. Again, I can do the same here. Okay. Uh, I noticed that we have some problem here. So again, I'm going to try and use the same uh, approach that we did. So maybe this time I will select these two nodes. Okay, again, replacing them. Uh, so guys, typically a uh, hypermesh isn't really this slow. It's just that, uh, you know, the system that you're using for meshing that has to be strong enough to uh, handle all of these entities. So again, this part is done. I will remesh the remaining part. Let's see if we are able to achieve something good. So yes, this looks decent enough. Uh, maybe if needed, we can work with it later. Again, as you have to opposite trias here, I will drag and drop. And again, this is done. Now, this is an interesting situation. So what I'll do is shift F6. I'll go to uh, shift F6 is basically the shortcut for splitting elements shortcut. I'll select this element. I'll choose an option to midpoint to trias. And let's see what happens. So now, as you can imagine, I have a few chords that can happen. So yes, this is the one and this is the another. So this is how, you know, you operate using uh, elements. So uh, if you have noticed here by default, Hypermesh has created this pattern, but somehow it wasn't able to do that on the left hand side. So I did it manually. Okay. Again, uh, we need to operate on similar fashion here as well. F7, these two nodes. Uh, 
okay and shift f6 divide quad perfect so hopefully with this we should get something good again uh, we have the same converging pattern here that's why the trial has appeared okay never mind so actually what is happening is uh, we have two opposite trias here so let me introduce one more concept okay so there is something known as feature angle let me show you what that really means okay so right now when we go to f12 uh, we set the feature angle to be 30 so if i select these elements so as you have noticed this is uh, the elements that i'm selecting they are over a bump okay they are no longer on the same surface we have a bump here so if I say mesh, uh, what has happened is hypermesh has tried to maintain uh, this line that I have. So this means that this angle that this bump is making with the plane surface that is maybe less than 30. Now let's see what happens if uh, you know I change the feature angle a little more. So again, I have selected the elements. This time I'm setting this to be 60 and same mesh. So as you have noticed, hypermesh is no longer following uh, this feature line, the green colored line that I had. Hypermesh by default uh, tried to, you know, uh, reorganize the entities as per uh, the logic that is there, you know, the redistribution of nodes as per the element length. So uh, sometimes this is advantageous, sometimes it is not. So particularly in this case, we needed this feature line to be captured. So I'm going to undo. Okay. And I'm going to set this back to 30. And yes, that should do it. Again, uh, I might need another trial element here. So I will allow AutoMesh to do it for me. So yeah, that is how it is there. So yes, guys. So this is basically how you operate uh, on the mesh using uh, you know your auto mesh operation and all the different commands that are available. So if you keep working in this fashion, uh, you might arrive at something that looks like this. Again, uh, this is not uh, maybe the final component or maybe the final polished mesh. But again, uh, if you do a lot of uh, surface cleaning, uh, if you do a bit of flow operations, this is how it looks like. And all this different coloring that is there because you know all these elements are failing in the particular quality criteria. So uh, right now to explain quality criteria and stuff like that, it will be uh, much difficult. So I won't get into that details. But yeah, with this, I would say that um, I can close the first part that I wanted to demonstrate, right? So this is how you keep generating a mesh that meets uh, the industry standards. So I'll take a pause here. Uh, just drop in your queries, if any, or if there's anything that is unclear, we can have it addressed. So, okay. Okay, so this is a good question. Uh, if we have to remesh for any reason, would the previous manual geometry cleanup be recovered or would we have to start from scratch for the cleanup? Okay, so guys, the thing is, once you remesh the elements, hypermesh will no longer pay attention to the green lines that you have drawn uh, for dividing your surface, except for the ones uh, that belong to the feature angle that I just demonstrated. So uh, the geometry cleanup will stay, but uh, the you know hypermesh won't follow the edges uh, that you have uh, so painfully you know drawn. So that is one answer. Next question is okay. So for you as beginners, how to understand mesh flow? Uh, 
I think the simplest way is the same example that I mentioned. So imagine that your mesh has to flow uh, from left to right or whatever, top to bottom. And the only other possible direction is the perpendicular direction. So if uh, you notice that, you know, the mesh is moving or flowing in any direction that is not as per these two directions, then maybe you need to do something about it. Okay. So that is uh, just the, you know, the most basic uh, way in which I can make you understand the mesh flow. But again, uh, if you want to go into much more details, the only option you are left with, unfortunately, is practicing and uh, maybe practice under someone else's guidance who has a good knowledge of mesh flow. Okay. Next. Uh, meshing, yes, it is a time taking process. Uh, there are some shortcuts, especially for the sheet metal components, but I wouldn't mention them at this stage. Uh, because as beginners, it is very important for you to understand how meshing really happens. So I will keep them hidden for now. Uh, what mesh flow is ideal? I understand this is a very important question for all of you. Unfortunately, uh, you will only get a feel of a good mesh flow when you have enough experience with the software. Okay. Why flow is required? Yes, that is again a very good question. So um, again, this will, uh, you will see the effect of mesh flow when you, uh, you know, actually do any kind of software. I think someone has started his screen sharing. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So why mesh flow is required? So in case of simulations, when, uh, you know, you have the calculations for stress and strain, uh, the way your shock wave propagates throughout the solid is determined by your mesh flow to some extent. And that is the reason why mesh flow is required. Yes, there is an automatic geometry cleanup option. But again, for the same reason, I'm not showing it right now because uh, automatic cleanup isn't always reliable and you won't really know what the software is doing okay so that is why uh, automatic option i'm not showing right now because once someone knows about the automatic uh, geometric cleanup option or automatic mesh option uh, we tend to you know follow that option more rather than practicing the hard way but trust me from my experience uh, if you are good at meshing you can survive in this industry for as long as you want So flow refinement, I think someone is mentioning uh, directly in ANSYS. So a direct flow refinement is not really uh, possible in Hypermesh because, um, you know, as I mentioned, um, the first step that we did, we selected all the faces and we just did an auto mesh. So you saw what kind of mesh was generated, right? So uh, a complete direct refinement is not really possible as of now. Um, if you use the direct 2D meshing option, uh, maybe you will arrive at a better mesh flow. So uh, there is one more technique that people use. So uh, there is an option in Hypermesh where you directly get, uh, you know, the mid surface, the mid surface mesh with an okay-ish quality. So what people do is they get this mesh and then they start operating on this mesh to take it to the level that is acceptable. So uh, if you want a list of the shortcut key for operating hypermesh, I've already mentioned, go to preferences, keyboard settings, and just click on all the keys from F1 to F12. Uh, you will know what every key does. Um, next thing, what you can try is uh, change the option to shift plus, and then again, you can go from F1 to F12. when we should use washer splits okay i think this question comes from someone who has some experience in simulation so uh, for now we will park this question because uh, it wouldn't be uh, on similar grounds with everyone next okay okay 
All right, so I think I have answered most of the questions. So now there are two ways in which we can proceed. One is I can show you the hyper uh, the hexa mesh, or what we could do is we could change the flavor a bit. We could go for the automation, and then if time permits, we can come back to the hexa mesh. So what is it that you want? Do you want to continue with mesh, or do you want to see the automation? Come on, guys! I'm waiting for your feedback. Okay, I see a lot of you are interested in automation. Well, that is no surprise. Okay, so let's change the game a bit. Okay, I'll share my screen again. All right, let's go to the PPT first. So uh, guys, two things are remaining. One is the hexa mesh and the other one is how to check the quality of a mesh. So I believe uh, checking the mesh quality, this is very important. So I will try to do that and then we can go to auto mesh. Okay, so I will hide some of these parts. Okay, so this is our original component. Um, I hope my screen is visible now. Um, I will import a mesh that someone else has created. Okay, so let me quickly show you the file. So if you can read the extension, the extension for this file is .fem. .fem files are basically the files that are created in Optistruct format. So before importing, what I've done is, if I click on this person icon, I've set my profile to Optistruct. And then when I click on, okay, so let it let it process. Okay, hopefully it's done. So whenever you typically, uh, you know, change the profile or maybe uh, do anything to the profile option, Hypermesh has to load the complete template. Uh, which is why it takes time uh, most of the times. Yes, it's done. So I'll go to import solver deck. So if you remember, deck is the convention that I used yesterday for different solvers. Optistruct, Abacus, Radios, Spam Crash, LS Dyna, all of these solvers. So I'll say open. Sheet metal is visible. In the, so you can also read all the supported file formats for this particular deck. So we are exporting a .fem file open and import. So uh, there are a lot of options for import available here, but as a beginner, just keep them as it is and say import. So I think someone asked a question yesterday on how do we reuse an existing mesh? So this is the answer. The mesh is typically saved as a FEM file or a .hm file. And you know you can just import it wherever you want, and uh, the rest is uh, pretty straightforward. So as you can see, whoever did this mesh, uh, he has completed the component. Uh, he has also assigned properties. He has also assigned materials, and all of them are basically imported in my current hypermesh model. Before we do that, I also want to show you how this file really looks like. So I'm going to open it in a text editor. Uh, my personal choice is uh, Notepad++. So, uh, you know, this is the text format of the file that we just imported. So what is there in it? So these are basically all of your notes. And, uh, you know, these are the coordinates for the notes. So these are the node IDs. So we will keep scrolling. And now uh, once the nodes are complete, you have the information on the elements okay so c quad 4 is basically the type of element that is being used by optistruct uh, quadrilateral element this is the element id and this um, is or these last four these are the combination of nodes that are used to you know build this element so again let's get rid of these 
and finally somewhere you should be able to see the component details as well mm, just a moment so the name for the component is sheet metal 2.0 let me just quickly search it okay so here it is so here you can see the component name uh, you will also see the property name uh, you, here somewhere you will notice what is the id of the property that is assigned to the component and so on so you don't really need to uh, you know be pro at reading this data because that is hypermesh job but yes it is always good to uh, know uh, what the file would look like if you open it in a you know text editor okay here are also your you know density values and uh, you know material properties so they are also available here okay so let's get rid of this text file let's focus on uh, you know the task at hand okay so the first thing that i would typically check is i would like to see if this mesh is complete meaning if there is anything missing uh, from the geometry or if there is something extra that is being captured so how do i do that i go to shift f3 i go to elements i don't know why zoom keeps popping up but anyway so i'll select all these elements i'll see free edges or find edges i'll switch this on and then i'll start from one particular location okay so now uh, if you can see the free edges are there at you know the surface boundaries so wherever i see a free edge uh, i am happy because you know uh, it is very well projected to the original geometry so yes that is uh, what a good mesh should be uh, i notice that there is some problem here because there is no free edge that appears here so i'll see what is happening uh, the problem is the mesh is there but the nodes aren't projected onto the outermost surface so in order to do that i can go to shift f7 surfaces maybe i'll select the nodes okay uh, here i'll select the surface to which it should be projected and here i can say either surface normal or i can define the vector also so let me define the vector because the surface normal would be in a different direction probably and project so as you can see the nodes moved if i go to the field geometry again i can see you know the nodes another problem is the orientation of the hole is not chosen properly so that is why you see a lot of trias appearing here also it was possible to capture this hole using six nodes but somehow this guy has used or whoever has done this mesh has used four uh, nodes so that is a problem see the problem with uh, capturing four nodes is uh, you have a lot of elements that are coming out of the original geometry you know so this part of the element is coming out this part this part so this later on causes problems for deep penetration you know i i told you what deep penetration is yesterday so yeah this creates a problem there next let's keep moving forward uh, let's first check if the geometry is captured so yes appears good let's see on the other side okay looks good uh i noticed some problem here so as you can see uh this hole is captured using six nodes this hole is captured using four nodes uh the mesh flow is completely distorted here so that is not good uh again same problem here the mesh flow is not good a lot of trias coming up the mesh uh, is not uniform uh there is one more option uh shift f12 here what you can do is you can smoothen your elements so what do i mean by smooth you just select them set the iterations to maybe 1000 and you can see the effect for yourself so smoothen basically redistributes your mesh so that all the elements they appear of uh, you know the appropriate size uh, whatever you have chosen so a uh, smooth operation also is at times very helpful okay let's focus on the geometry capturing part for now okay the geometry is captured well 
So as you can see, this guy has used reflect because you see the same pattern appearing here. Unfortunately, he has defeatured the fillet. Uh, this is not advisable. Wherever possible, we should capture the fillet. Uh, this whole orientation could have been better. So like I mentioned, if this hole was pointing in your Y direction, uh, you would have had a better mesh flow. Okay. Again, same thing here. Uh, if this guy has done a, would have done a simple remesh operation, uh, all these trias would disappear uh, here. So maybe I can demonstrate that part. F12 elements. Let's say five. I'll set this to 10 because I don't want to spoil uh, these sharp edges. So as you can see, just a remesh operation uh, fixed the complete problem for us. Anyway, moving forward, again, uh, the whole orientation, if he has chosen this orientation, then uh, maybe something could have been done to take care of the trias. Uh, two trias uh, very close to each other or sharing a node, this is not at all advisable. So again, that is a problem. Uh, typically, we never allow a trial to come near the free edge. So what could have been done is something like this. Shift F12, if I just use a smooth operation again. Yeah, so this is how it could have been, okay? Again, same problem here, opposite trias are there. You could have, uh, or maybe he could have combined them together to get a better mesh flow and stuff like that. So since it's a reflect, whatever problems appear here, similar problems will appear on the left-hand side as well. Uh, the good part is uh, this mesh flow is what was expected you know, the converging pattern. So yes, uh, that is something that is good. Okay, so this is about, you know, the geometry capturing part. Uh, one more uh, missing link is, if you observe these two features, there was a hole here, but here there was no hole. But somehow, uh, whoever did this, he forgot that, you know, there's a hole missing here. So uh, again, uh, here's an interesting part. Now, if I want to fill up this hole, now I don't have the mid surface, let's say. So there is something known as a ruled. What ruled does is it essentially uh, creates a mesh when between two set of nodes. So let's say this first, I will set my current component to be this. So if you want to set your current component, just click on this, this tab here and select whichever component you want. I'll go to ruled one, two, three, four. Uh, the reason why I'm counting is the order of the nodes is very important when you're using rule. Again, this delay is due to the graphics, not an issue of hypermesh. Okay. This next, let me show it to you by something different. So we can also select the nodes using path. So this is the first node. And this is the last node. So all the nodes that are there in between will be automatically selected. I'll say create, return. So as you can see, this part is filled up and our job is done. This red color is due to the, you know, the mid surface and not really uh, the mesh. All right, so this is all about geometry capturing. Let's talk about element quality. So there are a lot of ways to, you know, see the element quality. One is this color, uh, color coding. But again, uh, you can't really uh, uh, make out anything from this color quality. Like uh, if you have an overall view, uh, you wouldn't know which elements are failing. So for that, you can go to 2D quality index. Yeah, here, all the failed elements will be highlighted in yellow. So you can just zoom in and see uh, what the problem is. Uh, what's good is you also have cleanup tools. So if you just click on element optimize, it will sort of, uh, you know, get rid of the quality, but this does not always happen and maybe not always advisable. Okay. And then we can do something similar here.
okay so that is how you can take care of the quality uh, you can also see the number of failed elements here so we have still have one element that is failing in minimum angle quad so now let's say that i don't know where this element is located i can see that it is highlighted in yellow but for example let's say that i'm not able to see it what do i do i go to f10 i would say minimum angle quad and if i click here you can notice on the left hand side of the screen that is one element is filled out of 6519 elements i'll say save field return let's go to f5 i will click on this elements and here i have an option of retrieve so what is happening is when i pressed f10 in uh, you know the previous panel and said save hypermesh remembered this element now when i've said retrieve hypermesh has retrieved the information of that element uh, as you can see on the lower left hand side corner i'll say mask now i'll say reverse so only that one element is highlighted uh, if i still want to see all the neighbors i can use the option here before we do that i'll go to shift f2 drag and drop so here i have added some temp nodes just so that i can see uh, this element whenever i want to see it later now uh, if i click on this all the adjacent elements will start appearing and if i click on this uh, this complete component will be unmasked okay so now even if you are zoomed out you can see because of the temp nodes that i can easily make out where the failed element really is so that is one part and then the most important part is checking for the free edges so shift f3 uh, select all the elements find edges and you know just go through the component to see if there is any free edge at a location where it is not supposed to be okay so let's not get into too much details uh, everything is okay lastly let's go to tools there is something known as element normals so guys i can understand that all of these qualities are a bit too much to you but i am just showing this to you for the sake of completeness when you actually start working with hypermesh then you will have a better understanding of you know what these qualities are and how you clear them and stuff like that <clears throat> so i think uh, skill link has also uploaded a lot of videos on uh, what element quality is all about so you can maybe have a look at them as well talking about element normals i will select all the elements uh, i want them to be displayed in color and i'll say display so all the elements which have the normals in one direction are colored blue the opposite direction are colored red now the problem is if you see here these are the elements that we created using rule and they have the opposite orientation so as you can see everything is blue if we look from this direction but these are not so what you can do is you can adjust and automatically everything will be fixed okay so that is all about element normals so this is how you do a mesh check uh, once you have finished you know your component uh, once you have finished meshing your component so i understand this was a bit hard or maybe difficult to grasp at first but like i mentioned since you are beginners uh don't worry about it with practice and you know with more experience you will be able to understand what these qualities are so i'll take a short break again if there are any queries i'll address them if not we will talk about automation okay uh there is a question why we need to align element normals so again uh, we need to do this uh, because the simulations demand it um okay see the problem that i'm facing is uh, to explain some of these things i need you guys to have some basic information about what fea is and uh, you know how stuff operates inside fea so if you don't have that uh, it is a bit difficult or it can be a bit difficult for you to understand what i'm saying but uh, to put it simple uh, let's say displacement for example so as you can understand displacement needs direction as well as magnitude right so if i say a displacement of 10 mm uh, you will ask me okay 
that's fine but what would be the direction is it plus z minus z plus y minus y or something like that so this is where uh, you know the element normals come into play um, and that is maybe the most a rough idea that i can tell you about if a part is symmetric about one plane then is there any option to replicate the same mesh on the other side okay that's a good question i can quickly show you how to reflect so guys any of these simple operations that you can think about they are very much possible let's say uh, we want to reflect this complete component about this plane okay so just for an example i'm reflecting the complete component so tools inside tools you will find reflect what are we reflecting we are reflecting elements i'll select all these elements i can also use the displayed option next let's define the plane 1 2 and 3 <clears throat> and finally reflect So as you can see, what is happening is the original elements are reflected as well. If you want to avoid that, what you can say is elements duplicate. Uh, it will ask you whether you want to duplicate them to the original component, that is sheet metal 2.0, or the current component. In our case, uh, right now both these components are the same, but typically uh, we say it as original component and say reflect. Okay, so this is how the mesh would look like. uh one thing that would be missing is you know we will get free edges here as i discussed at the beginning so you will need to fix these free edges which also uh, we have talked about okay so i think i've answered the reflect part anything else guys okay so are you ready to get to the automation part or is anything unclear still okay is it is it boring guys or are you too overwhelmed by it because i see very less response what's wrong well let me do this i promise you uh, the automation part is going to be super interesting okay all right okay so um let me first tell you what problem we are going to solve using automation and just one minute so this is the file that uh, you know we were working with yesterday okay so this has all of these components all right so this is the file that we are going to use but before that let's go through the ppt once so we are finished with the first part of the session in the second half uh, let's talk about automation okay so what is the need for automation and right now i am only going to talk about automation in the pre processing box by pre processing what i mean is meshing uh, maybe uh, deep penetration connections and you know deck setup and something like that so uh you know uh, like i mentioned oem odm all that business so typically for the ce industry the billing that happens in the industry is based on the number of hours that you spend in you know uh building the model and doing some kind of analysis and it wouldn't be a surprise to you to know that 50% of this complete time for the project is allocated for meshing okay now there are some companies that offer ce services which get paid on the basis of the number of hours so now imagine that uh, you know you are saying that okay you actually need uh, let's say about 1500 hours for the complete project but you take 2000 hours okay so this additional 500 hours is a burden on the company on the contrary if you complete the project in 1000 hours then those 500 hours are an additional profit right so for all such industries time is money quite literally 
and this is where uh, you know automation comes into play and this is why all the industries are running behind automation automation in meshing automation in element quality checks uh, automation in uh, you know case setup automation in results and stuff like that so uh, all in all automation has uh, has been a prime focus for most of the ca industry and most of the ca service providers as well so uh, you know what activities can be automated so most of these activities as you might have noticed they are repetitive they are time consuming and yet they are critical for the project so for all such activities you can you know create automated solutions one good thing about automation is uh, for example let's say you want some automation with respect to part numbering part naming and stuff like that then uh, if you automate the process it will be followed everywhere throughout your company which is why it also becomes a standard so let's say you are meshing a component your colleague is meshing a component both of these components will have some similarities with respect to standardization and again standardization forms the base pillar for you know automation then as i mentioned uh, automation saves time for the ca industry and you know time is money literally i've already stressed that point now let's talk about which parts of the ca process can be automated so as you can imagine uh, all the list uh, all the list of the processes that i just mentioned uh, with respect to meshing or element quality return uh, element quality checks and stuff like that they can be automated uh, lastly the best part about automation with hypermesh is all you have to do to automate in hypermesh is control c and control v yes it's actually that simple the reason is as i mentioned yesterday whatever operation you perform in hypermesh that is being written down in the form of a code in the background in a command.tcl file so if we go to documents which is my current working directory you can see that my command 1.tcl file is being written so the latest update is at 831 because that is when we uh, you know operated hypermesh so if i if you just open this file you can see a list of commands that you have performed and how hypermesh sort of addresses that okay so as you can see we just opened up a new file that was demo parts so you know this is basically the code to do that if you just copy paste this code and you know put it uh, in the appropriate dialog box the same operation will be performed by hypermesh okay so that is why i mentioned that automation in hypermesh is really that easy okay so let's move ahead <clears throat> so now with that as a background if someone would say okay how do i create macros for hypermesh so the following things are a prerequisite for that first thing is you should be able to perform that same operation in hypermesh well that's pretty obvious so um, to put it in a simpler way if you want to let's say translate a particular node so you should practically know how to translate a node manually in hypermesh only then you can basically write a code for it right next is to know which files to look for so as i mentioned command.tcl is the one file that you know with can be of a real help next is to learn where to look for help so there is extensive help available uh, from the hypermesh or hyperworks community uh, there is also extensive help from the tcl tk uh, programming language as well so yeah help is definitely available uh, another thing to know is some of the very basics of programming for tcl and tk tcl is tool command language which is used to write all the logics for hypermesh and tk is known as tool kit which is used to you know create all the guis that you see in hypermesh so you don't need to understand the complete tcl language you only need to understand maybe how to write an if loop how to write a for loop or some stuff like that then uh, you know you start off with some basic codes um, addition subtraction hello world stuff like that then you try to understand how hypermesh uh, treats uh, some of its basic commands so with that you will be acquainted with uh, the basic codes for hypermesh <clears throat> sorry 
lastly when you actually want to do something meaningful and you actually want to write a code that will help the industry or it will benefit the industry that you are working for you should know the so the the manual solution for the problem at least only when you know the manual solution you can automate it so yeah that is how uh, you automate in hypermesh and finally if you are someone who has some knowledge about automation then you know these are all the opportunities that uh, will come your way so you know with time everyone gets better in pre processing you know if you spend let's say 8 hours a day with meshing maybe in a couple of months you will be pro in meshing and that is something that is going to happen but with automation you really stand out from the crowd because not everyone knows how to automate stuff right next uh, since you uh, when you are doing pre processing you have already faced the problems you are the best suited people to automate solutions so you know instead of uh, hiring someone from the Uh, the computer background or the coders you guys will be the pioneers you will be the leaders who will uh, you know create automated solutions for your company uh if you are someone who loves coding uh, you know something like this can happen people from hypermesh will recruit you to actually help uh, make hypermesh better so stuff like that is also possible and yeah so maybe the other things we can leave um okay so this is you know the very basic uh, heartbeat of how hypermesh operates okay understanding this is very important to write a code which is why i am explaining this one very basic principle but there are a lot of other things that come into play but again as i mentioned they they are beyond the scope of this course so if you want hypermesh to perform any operation so for example moving a node deleting an element moving an element from one collector to another hypermesh cannot do that operation directly what hypermesh does is hypermesh has two buckets uh the id of the bucket is 1 and 2 and hypermesh can only operate on these buckets okay so if you want to for example delete an element what hypermesh will do is hypermesh will put that element in one bucket and then hypermesh will delete that bucket okay so this is the one principle logic that you need to understand to write any code in hypermesh okay so with that as a background um let's actually build one macro at least before we end this session okay so uh, what is the problem statement for the macro so as you can imagine uh, let's say if you are taking the example for the complete instrument panel of your car so there will be so many uh, you know number of components involved uh, you will have your trim the leather trim or whatever premium segment trims that you are using you will have your air vents the cluster uh, instrument cluster and you know n number of components so when you are actually building a model all of these parts will have to be meshed and as you can understand one person cannot do this meshing so sometimes in industry what happens is you have a team that is doing the meshing and things are basically divided in these teams so when you want to you know uh, divide the activity you need to tell people that okay which part does he really has to mesh so you can either tell him the name but if the names are not available what you do is you know you take a screenshot and you know just send it over that okay this is the component that you want to mesh but now imagine you have close to 200 to 220 components so will you manually keep you know are uh, taking a screenshot for all these components well, the obvious answer is no so what is the answer well the simple answer is automation so uh with this uh, let me show you uh how that stuff or that thing is done in hypermesh manually and then i'll show you the code that i have written to do that okay so now let's say i want to uh okay one more thing let us have a look at uh, where our command file has ended so just remember this point okay so this is where our command file has ended now what i'm going to do is i'm going to just select one component i'm going to say isolate only so that only that component is displayed i'm going to press f so f is for fit screen i am going to uh, say a shaded geometry representation and then 
what I'm also going to do is uh, I'm going to set it into ISO view. So the button for ISO view is somewhere hidden behind uh, this zoom dialog box. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not, uh, it is not disappearing by default, but anyway, so that is, you know, the operation that I want to do. So once this operation is done, I will use these buttons here for, you know, uh, taking a screenshot. So if I click on this, what it will do is it will take a screenshot and save it to my clipboard. Once this process is done, I will move on to the next component. I'll say isolate only again, F. I will set it to isometric view and then take another snap. So this is the process that I will repeat. Now uh, let me see the command file and figure out what is happening. Okay. So as I mentioned, this lowermost part is what was written by hypermesh right now. So, uh, for now, just ignore this line. I'm commenting it. Okay. Now focus on the second line, star create mark components to bracket. Okay. So this create mark is the command that I just mentioned where, you know, the two buckets existed, right? So these buckets are known as marks. And, uh, right now what hypermesh is doing is hypermesh is putting the component, which has the name bracket to into a mark which has an id of two okay again uh, one more operation hypermesh is performing so this is basically switching on the geometry and elements and this lastly is the isolate command so if you remember i did right click i pressed isolate and you know that is it so these three are the principal commands that uh, had to be used okay now that is done. So my job now is to repeat these commands for all the components, right? So with whatever little knowledge of TCLTK I have, I've created a short code for doing this operation. Let me show it to you. Okay. So it's surprising. Uh, it isn't really surprising that just this few 14 lines of code can actually do the job that might have taken you about hours, right? Okay. So first one, again, this is a command from TCLTK file MKDIR stands for make directory. I'm creating a folder in my working directory, which has the name snaps. Okay. Next, uh, I need to repeat this complete operation for all the components in my model, right? So I'm selecting all the components and placing them in the mark one. I am saving all of these components in a variable A because, you know, I'll have to loop through that variable so that I can snap all the components. As I mentioned, I will need a loop to, you know, do this thing. So that is what this is doing. Um, this second line, uh, you can ignore for now. What I'm trying to do is I am trying to name the file uh, as per the name of the component in hypermesh. So HM entity info is a command in hypermesh that can, uh, you know, extract the name of the component. So this is a syntax for it. Uh, you don't have to be bothered about the syntax. I just want you to get a feel of how automation is done. Then lastly, what I did is I just copied uh, the lines from the command file, put it here. Uh, this is what would have written in the command file if I press on, uh, you know, the isometric view button. And this line is basically fit window. So when I press F, this is the code that is written. So essentially this much part of the code, I directly copy pasted from my command file. I had to use no brain to do that. And this last command is again, something that comes from hypermesh uh, help star JPEG file, because I'm creating a JPEG file star jpg file named and this is the path for the file so snaps is the folder dollar title has uh, you know the name of the component so let's see uh, how this file operates okay let me first go to documents as you can see there is no snaps folder here uh, this is how you run a tcl command go to file run tcltk you paste the path and then you say open 
So as you can see, one by one, all the components are being displayed. They are being snapped and they are being saved. Okay, so Hypermesh has completed the operation. Let's go here. Snaps folder has appeared. And then we have all the snaps for, you know, all of these different components. So, uh, you know, uh, writing this code, um, we already have a, a nice course on TCLTK for Hypermesh. So that is where all these different syntax problems and, you know, uh, how to look for different commands, where does uh, everything come from? All of this is covered. But right now with this example, I just wanted to give you a feel of what automation can be automation. So yeah, with that, I have completed what I had in store for, um, you know, the automation part. One last thing that I wanted to show is, um, just give me a moment. Okay, so I will isolate this. So what I've done is I have written a script to display the free edges and I have also assigned that script to one of my keyboard shortcuts. So if I now press that keyboard shortcut, that script will be called and you know, the free edge display will be turned on. So, you know, I don't have to go to shift F3. I don't have to select elements or stuff like that. All I have to do is press the keyboard shortcuts and everything is done by default. So, you know, this is how you can be most productive uh, with respect to the automation. And yeah, um, it's a whole new world of opportunities uh, with automation. So yes, I have talked a lot. Now it's your turn. Uh, if you have any queries, I'll be more than happy to answer. Uh, if there are any queries with respect to the code or how it is done. So as I mentioned, I just wanted to give you a taste. Uh, the details of this, uh, maybe uh, we, we can discuss in some other session or, uh, you know, I think you will come to know how you can ha have better information about uh, this thing. Okay.